Welcome to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. It's beautiful out our windows, and it's great to be inside the room. And we have the, the fragrance of a beautiful cassoulet that today's speakers have prepared for us. We'll hear more about them in a minute, but we, they are setting the bar pretty high. From now on, we're going to expect all speakers to have a cassoulet like that. Um, that sound in the overhead, do we know what that is, Bob? Ice machine, aha, okay, the ice machine. <laughs> Welcome the ice machine. <laughs> a little bit about future speakers. Uh, at the end of the year, Gary Jobson will be coming west to talk to us all about his 19th of those books he's written, kind of defining the world of yachting during his tenure as really a sailing ambassador to the world. Um, in uh, earlier, in, sooner in December, we'll hear from Christy Nelson, who wrote a beautiful uh, book called The Beautiful Illusion about the creation of Treasure Island in the middle of our bay. Uh, at the end of November, you'll get to be uh, talk to Mikhail Venikoff. Mikhail Venikoff is a U.S. Army Ranger who then made a business transitioning military into the civilian world through incredible adventures that he puts them on. Also in November, we'll hear from Lee Bruno, who wrote Misfits, Merchants, and Mayhem, Tales of the San Francisco Waterfront. Fascinating person. It'll be a great talk, I can tell you. Uh, Gina Barty will be here uh, in November to talk to us all about the incredible Maritime Library that is at the Maritime Museum just a few blocks away from us. Next week... Russ Sylvester will be here to talk all about the San Francisco or, or the St. Francis Challenge Committee. This is a very powerful and valuable and unique and creative committee. Uh, Russ has mustered uh, the resources of the club and our sailors uh, to do an incredibly successful job challenging or accepting challenges with yacht clubs all around the country. And they couldn't be doing that without the leadership, the stalwart leadership of our Commodore. So please welcome the historic first female Commodore in the St. Francis Yacht to our uh, to our podium. Hello to Teresa Brandner. Thank you, Ron, and uh, welcome everyone, members and guests here in the room, and those of you who are tuning in online. I just talked with Lloyd. He usually watches online, but he's here today, so welcome, Lloyd. And uh, I just want to say that Ice Machine is a very important and integral part of our service here, and I think, it's, I think it's actually an associate member of the club, but not sure I'll have to check on that with a membership committee. Regardless, um, today's uh, lunch is actually special today. I did try the cassoulet. I'm going back for seconds. It's really, really good. So thank you, and um, our, our speakers today will talk a little bit about food, and I have been cruising, and I know what it's like to not have fantastic food and to have fantastic food, and huge difference. So um, uh, looking forward to the presentation today, and again, welcome everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Teresa. Our speakers, uh, the two of them, essentially uh, both started sailing at different times. Landon, she started as a baby in a canoe in Canada. Uh, what a beautiful way to start sailing. And as she uh, uh, grew older, she sailed in other boats, racing boats and cruising boats, and noticed that we they never really had as good a food on water in cruising in yachting environments as you can make at home. But she was an engineer, so you know, how do you take this discontent with the food uh, 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 offshore and uh, your own profession? She got her master's in chemical engineering and um, met our other speaker, Tony, who likewise had been sailing. He started at age 24, first sailed on a gaff rig schooner. I've not done that. A gaff rig, I mean a, 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 a catch rig schooner, a catch rig schooner, I haven't done that, but he sailed in that catch rig schooner and again noticed that the food wasn't quite good enough. He went on to get his PhD in chemical engineering and the two of them lined up to basically create incredibly good food for the racing and cruising sailors. I can say about that that 50 years ago this year, in the month of November 68, I was racing in the Mazatlan race. And we were ashore for five days as we're getting close to the tip of Cabo. Charlie Weaver, then Commodore of another yacht club in the bay, threw the line, or er, er, saw two 
uh, my, my jump over the back and he said, Michael, go get the pole. And we all looked, there's a pole, there's a fishing pole on the boat? Yes, port side underneath my berth. Kid comes back with the pole, he's 14 years old, hands it to Charlie Weaver. Charlie throws the line overboard, boom, immediately gets a fish. Michael, he says, as the fish is being reeled in, go get the gaff. There's a gaff on the boat? Yes, half port side under my berth. Comes up with a gaff, flips the Mahi Mahi, which he caught in the time I'm telling you, just that fast, flips it onto the uh, cockpit of this beautiful boat called Amarita, and we bring out this hibachi and cook the incredible Mahi Mahi while it's going from its native color to the silverness we see in stores. That was the last time I had a great meal offshore. <laughs> And with that, I want to welcome Tony and Landon, the creators of 30 Knot Gourmet, to tell us how to do it. Thank you, boy. That was a great story. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's, it's our pleasure to be here today. Uh, this is Tony, and I'm Landon, and we're from 30 Knot Gourmet. And we wanted to make sure that you could have a ridiculously good gourmet experience even while, in, even while eating on the rail, even in 30 knot winds. So, so we're going to start with a short video. Um, we've provisioned three pack cup races, um, which are from here to Hawaii. And uh, so I wanted to start with just a short video that shows a little bit about uh, food in action while you're in the middle of a race. It was a J124. All right. So, um, so yeah, this just gives you a little bit of, of a feel of uh, what it's like to have, you know, good food in on the ocean, and it helps. All right. Um, in addition to being a, a scientist, uh, Tony was actually the captain of his own uh, cruiser for two, two and a half years in the Caribbean and in Central America. And you can see him way at the top of the mast up here on this boat. And I love the fresh food, I love uh, fresh drinks, and one of my preferred go-to equipments on a cruise to the, to the Spanish Virgin Islands was a two-stroke blender so that we could make uh, tasty beverages under the stars. Um, and as we all know, you know, provisioning has been the heart of the Navy and of sailing for so many for so many years. Um, you know, that's what the, the, the Navy runs on its stomach, or as Samuel Pepys says much more eloquently than I do, Englishmen, and more especially seamen, love their bellies above anything else. And so we looked out to what provisioning looked like in His Majesty's Navy way back in 1777, and the sailors there had to make do on salt pork and suet and, and peas, but at least they got some beer and, and rum rations to wash it down. And fortunately, the, the storage back in the day allowed the ship's biscuits to be guaranteed to be weevil free. So provisioning has come a long way since then, but... Although the, the weevil free part isn't, isn't necessarily guaranteed. You can see on this, uh, this picture here, this, this was some flour that we, uh, that we purchased in the San Blas Islands. And you can see the tracks from the weevils running around in the flour there. Although it turns out if you sieve out the weevils, the, the bread that you make is, is perf perfectly fine. <laughs> and it's got a bit of extra protein. <laughs> so for today's talk, we're going to talk about um, focusing on sort of 30 to 70 foot um, yachts, and we're talking about multi-day ocean racing, multi-day offshore and coastal cruising. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the differences between racing and cruising. Uh, we're going to focus on, on um, we'll talk about both of those. In racing, you've got full crew, there's more likely to be heavy weather, people, are racers are often chasing the heavy weather rather than avoiding it. Boats are weight conscience, conscious, performance is important. And there's not a lot of free time. People are mostly either uh, racing or resting. Um, constipation is an issue on race boats, on long distance racing. And so uh, you, we need to address that in our provisioning. Cruising tends to be shorthand, is often shorthanded. Um, there's less, less heavy weather. Performance is less important. 
And there's often downtime when people can cook, so you can take a more um, relaxed approach. Both cases, um, seasickness and uh, exhaustion is, uh, are both possibilities. So everything has to be um, convenient and, and easy uh, to do in a, in a hurry and in, in heavy weather. So I guess we define these as, as race provisioning is efficient, um, something that has to be efficient, um, and cruise provisioning can be from scratch. And on this slide, on the on the right-hand slide side of the panel, you can see some of the things that we were provisioning with when we were cruising. There's um, there's a delicious lionfish, um, which is pretty tasty once you cut off the toxic spines. Um, that's a land crab from Trinidad there, which has got a rather nasty nip on its claws. We've um, got local knowledge on how to prepare that, and that's some. Uh, that's some scones that were, we cooked underway on the, in, in there as well. And there's lots of recipes at icebath.com, which is our cruising blog, if anyone wants to see, see that. What is that blog again? icebath.com, I-S-P-A-F.com. So, provisioning styles. Um, we've split these into three. There's what we call hardcore, dehydrated food, no refrigeration, probably a jet boil as a only source of heat. Cocaine and power bars is the way I've heard some shorthanded racers describe that style of provisioning. Um, there's the efficient frozen boil in the bag, probably got a stove top, may or may not have refrigeration or be prepared to use the power for refrigeration. That's mostly where we're going to focus on in this talk. Um, and then there's cook on board where you can use fresh ingredients, you can package up um, bread mixes and make no need bread underway. You've, you've almost, you've probably got refrigeration or freezing. You might even have a microwave on a on a large cruising boat. So now let's move on to the process of provisioning. And our our, our focus for racing, I should have mentioned this earlier, is that tasty food, higher morale, faster times. So the process is assessment. So ass assessing what you've got, what the what the passage is, a crew survey, then meal planning shop and prep, package, draw, create menus, maps and instructions, and then finally stow before you set off. So you break down the process into these steps. It's, uh, it becomes much more manageable. So in terms of the, the assessment, there's the expected passage conditions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a slide or two. And then there's equipment. Is there a cold box? Is there a fridge? Is there a freezer available? Jet boil, stove top, oven, water maker or not, um, storage, how much and where. And then I'm going to talk about some of the appliances that we recommend that you have on board for, for provisioning, for, for making it work well. A pressure cooker is, is a great thing to have. Um, there's a particular model and brand that we recommend, the Kuhn Recon Duramatic, and that's on the slide. Um, they're great because they're sealed. If it tips over, everything doesn't go everywhere. If you're doing boil in the bag, which is mostly what, what, how we focus on, um, you can put them in there. You just bring it up to, temp to pressure, turn it off. Ten minutes later, it's, it's ready to serve. Um, French press, stainless steel again, vacuum. Um, we'll keep coffee or tea hot for, for several hours. Um, press pot. Great for night watches. That's this uh, thing where you fill it up with boiling water. They'll last for the whole watch. People can put in their instant coffee or their instant soups. Just push the button, the hot water comes out, and they're good to go. Um, for storage, I like vegetable hammock. Um, is pretty good, keeping an airflow around vegetables. Um, some people use uh, uh, plastic baskets and build rails for them. Um, solenoid defeat, this is something that you should have. So solenoids are a great safety feature for propane, but if your electricity fails halfway across an ocean, you don't want your stove to fail. So bring along a, a hose and the appropriate bits of valving so that you can just connect the propane straight to the stove without, without a solenoid. Um, and a vacuum sealer is something that's really useful when getting ready for the, for the, uh, for the passage. So we've assessed the boat. Now it's time to do a crew questionnaire. First of all, we have to establish who's the point person on the boat, who's the crew member that's going to be responsible for provisioning. And that has to be that person, whether or not you're outsourcing it or doing it yourself. For cruisers, is there a cook on board? Is there a cook on board? Is there somebody who likes to cook or does nobody really like cooking? 
much the difference to how you're going to provision depending whether that's the type of person that, that's on board. For the crew questionnaire, the, there's, this is sort of the hierarchy, is allergies. If there are any allergies, if someone's got a peanut allergies, you don't want any peanuts on the boat, you don't want anaphylactic shock miles out to sea. Um, dietary restrictions that need to be addressed. And then from there you go to dislikes, preferences, comfort food, um, things that are nice to have, um, but if you can't reconcile everyone's um, desires there, then, then uh, it's not the end of the world. Um, meal planning. So what goes into this is the length of the trip and the expected conditions. Uh, for example, on a passage to Hawaii, first few days are likely to be heavy weather. You're beating. Um, people are going to get seasick. They haven't got their sea legs. You want to keep the food pretty bland, easy to eat. Um, you know, then you go into a, into a, a reach. It's getting easier. People have got their sea legs, and then finally you're in the tropics, and you're, you've got the nice down downwind ride. Um, you can get a little more creative. Um, plan for about 30% more than expected for the journey, um, just just in case weather doesn't the, um, doesn't doesn't play ball or you get a breakage. And then finally, we like to um, put on board a, a bucket of prepper food. Uh, there's a picture on here of prepper food. This is a 30-day supply for one person. Um, you know, if something really bad happens, you get dismasted and you're going to limp home, it's going to take you an extra week. You won't starve if you've got this stuff on board. And it doesn't taste great, so um, that gives you an incentive to get home quickly. Um, also, in terms of meal planning, um, you know, obviously fresh food first, preserved food later, blander food first. Plan for three meals a day um, and lots of snacks. Snacks are very important, um, and, and we'll mention it again later, but package the snacks by day. Have excess, otherwise all the good stuff will go in the first couple of days, and all the, be le at the end you won't be left with the great stuff. So pack it, package it all up on the, it by day. Um, tasty, healthy, nutrient-dense meals. Add fibre. We add soluble fibre to our stews. Um, water. You want one and a half to two litres of drinking water per day per person. And if you've got a tank, if, if the water doesn't taste great in your tank, you can actually pre-treat it and uh, clean the tank out by adding bleach. About one teaspoon to ten gallons two or three days before. Let it slosh around. The, the chlorine bleed. The chlorine will just evaporate. It'll end up if if you don't wait long enough. It'll just taste like uh, city water on a bad day. <laughs> um, and then you can mask the water, the flavour with, um, with with the various things. Um, shopping. Shopping takes always takes a lot longer than you expect. Um, break it down into shopping lists. Um, assign crew to do the do shopping. Don't do. Don't let all one person do it all. Um, and make a list of the fresh items that you're going to want to, to provision last minute because you're going to be rushed with everything at the last minute. So you want to be able to do that efficiently. Um, prep boil in the bag meals early. If you're making your own boil in the bag meals, um, which is what we do at 30 Knot Gourmet, we want to make sure that if. Um, Otto we want to make sure that if they're not refrigerated, if the refrigeration fails or you don't have it, that it's, it's an inconvenience, not a disaster. So we sterilize our boil in the bags. When you do this, it's great to make these meals about 10 days, two weeks in advance, and leave one packet somewhere warm, server cabinet, airing cupboard, and just make sure that it's sterile. If it stays vacuum packed, if, there, if there's no gas evolves, you're good to go. If, um, if you see it start to blow up, you didn't quite get it right. Um, so that's, that's a good check. Um, you can consider two portions um, for each meal so that different watches can eat fresh or you can combine them. And uh, add fibre to stews. That's, uh, that again, we've mentioned that before. So I'm going to talk a little bit about dehydrated food um, if you're doing the shorthanded, hardcore thing. First of all, taste the dehydrated food that you're planning to bring because some of it is vile. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to find that out when you first open it. Some of it's okay, but some of it is beyond belief. You want about two servings per person, so whatever on the packet says this is one serving is actually half a serving. Um, and 
pack a measuring cup. If it's coming in, in buckets, if it's not portioned out already, make sure you've got the right size measuring cup so that you're not worrying about trying to do this as the boat's tossing, being tossed around. Um, add about 10% more water than the instructions say and add a little bit of a tablespoon or so of oil to the, to the mix. Um, it's very important to give it a chance to rehydrate. Eating non-fully rehydrated, dehydrated food is actually dangerous. Um, it can sort of pull out the, the, the it's not good. Um, <laughs> And if you put it into a thermos, um, you know, there's a picture here of a thermos. That's a 24-ounce thermos. It'll keep warm for, for eight hours or so. So that then it's, uh, it, once it's done, it's done. And in the middle, that's a picture of a jet boil, which is a really efficient um, device for heating water. Vacuum packed. Um, here, if you're doing it yourself, prep the food, um, cook the stews, whatever it is. Measure them into vacuum bags, about 24 to 32 ounces per portion, which is for four people. If you're using a food saver, um, freeze, freeze them at that point. Once they're frozen, you can vacuum and seal. Um, and then you want to boil them for 30, 40 minutes to an hour. This is the sterilizing part. So you want to get them well over 70, 80 degrees Celsius, close to boiling point. Um, and then you can freeze them for stowage. Leave, as we said, leave a tester at room temperature for 10 days or so. Um, when you want to reheat them, you put them in a pressure cooker, you bring it up to the temperature to the first puff of steam and uh, turn the heat off. By the time it's come down, it's ready to go. A um, couple of options. One is to use a chamber vacuum sealer instead of a food saver. These are a couple of hundred bucks, but they let you, or three, three four hundred bucks, but they let you... Um, vacuum liquids, so mu much more efficient, much quicker. If you're doing a lot of these, then then they're definitely worth the investment. And the other the other option you can do is you can use sous vide rather than just boiling, and this is what we do. Um, so, for example, the cassoulet that some of you had today, by the time you'd put it boiling for an hour, it would have turned to mush. So what we do is we'll we'll cook it, we'll vacuum pack it, and then we'll heat it to about 60, uh, 75 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to kill all the, all the uh, p potential pathogens, um, but it doesn't turn it to mush. And so that's, that's the 30 knot gourmet secret, and it's easy enough to do that. You can also do veggies that way, so like boiled potatoes, uh, root vegetables. If you heat them at about 85 Celsius, um, they, they don't get soft after an hour or an hour and Hour and, a half, hour and a half, so then you've got stuff that you can reheat that's essentially pre-cooked. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let Landon talk, tell you a little bit about uh, shelf life and how we think about how we think about food. All right. So another key consideration when you're thinking about provisioning for a longer journey, such as the pack cup, is the shelf life of different foods. And again, you just get into that habit of thinking about what foods will last for the first three, four days, what, what, what foods will last through the mid part of the journey, and what foods do you reserve for the end of the journey. Um, there's some things that we've listed down at the bottom of this slide that will last throughout, and a, a couple of them are things like UHT milk, which is less common here, but you can get Parmalat, for instance, on Amazon, and that milk will, will last the whole journey. Um, but, but going back to the beginning, the day one to four is where you can enjoy fresh food. You can enjoy salads, fruits, fresh bread, smoked salmon. In the mid-range, uh, by then, you're looking for heartier fruits and vegetables like apples and citrus. Cured meats, of course, are very good and they're a high, high energy density for the mid part of the journey. Uh, Bimbo brand bread, which is from Latin America and has a lot of preservatives, lasts actually quite a long time. Uh, so do flour, flour tortillas. So when you're looking into the mid to the end of the journey, uh, those, those things will, will hold up, whereas regular bread won't. By 
once you're past 10 days, you, you really have just the hardiest of the fresh food, the cabbage, potatoes, carrots. Uh, one trick is that eggs will last if they've never been refrigerated. Uh, the trick is to, um, is to turn them frequently to keep the inner membrane intact, and then they st last quite a long time. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and down below, again, um, salami, nuts, rice, beans, and, and of course, freeze dries and, and canned foods will last the whole time. But with some thought, you can keep your fresh food going for quite a while. Uh, the next slide is snacks. And of course, snacks uh, are really, really important. Um, and they're kind of divided into three. We, the the, the nutrient-dense snacks, which are often quick meal substitutes when things are a little hairy. Uh, you want to be able to grab some nuts, some boiled eggs, some trail mix protein bars uh, at any time, day or night. Uh, and then. The other snacks really depend on the crew's preference. Some people like more savory snacks, including you know, crackers, but salami and uh, uh, packaged cheese can last well. And sweet snacks, chocolate's a great one, um, cookies. And uh, we hear a lot about chocolate-covered espresso beans, especially in the middle of the night, being helpful. Uh, on the beverage side, um, ca again, caffeine is a, is a recurring theme. Uh, we like to have pre-portioned fresh coffee available so that it can quickly be put into a fresh uh, a French press and make a pot very without with minimal effort. But we also believe that you should have some instant coffee available for the middle of the night. And Starbucks instant coffee is is actually not not bad. Um, uh, other hot beverages include instant soups and hot chocolate, depending on the crew preferences. And of course, the cold beverages are water, 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 uh, with, as Tony said, whatever masking agents you, you, you may need, depending on the quality of your water tank. Um, but you really want to make sure that you get one, to t one and a half to two liters per person per day and, and encourage people to be drinking early and often. And you want to try to think about minimizing weight, so we generally don't unless a crew member really demands it, bring a lot of cans or pre-made pre uh, beverages. But some, some crew mem members can't exist without their can of, of soda, and so, of course, you make that work. Um, and then the real trick, of course, is to, is to package it. And, and again, this is a step that, that uh, all sailors know. It's all, about, it's all about being very, very organized and making it as easy as possible for the crew. Uh, do you want to wrap in plastic or paper? Of course, paper is more eco-friendly, but the real question is, how dry is your boat? So inevitably, there's a fair amount of plastic involved, but, but we stow it and bring it back home. Uh, we package by meal and by day, and we keep very uh, detailed uh, logs about what goes with what. Uh, we've already mentioned you want to avoid all the grid snacks disappearing, so you, pop, you pop portion the snacks by day, and, um, and we always test ahead. So once, once you've got to that point, then the, the, you, wanna, you need to write up a menu, a map, and instructions. Um, so the menu should be taped, some, they should be laminated, the menu should be taped where everyone can see it, they know what's coming. If they decide to switch a meal up, they know, they know which day's meal to go grab if it's too rough for a particular uh, meal at a particular time. You want instructions, need to be very, very simple. Um, you probably can't read it here, but for example, at the lunchtime, it says take, take din the next dinner out put of the freezer and put it in the fridge, uh, in the sink to thaw for the, for the next meal that's coming in a few hours. It also should tell you where to go if the things aren't in the actual bags, if they're stored somewhere else. Um, and then a map, there should be a stowage map of where things are going, uh, or a very minimum, uh, there should be a couple of crew members who know where things, uh, things are. Um, and then, the, for your actual stowing, designate, again, designate a crew member that's responsible. For storage, you can put um, frozen food into a sealed cooler with dry ice, about 30 to 50 pounds of dry ice. Wrap it in newspaper, a couple of inches of dry ice, frozen food, another layer of dry ice. If the cooler is sealed with duct tape so that the, the carbon dioxide can't get out, that will last for five or six days. So you can put the, the, the latter meals in a cooler, tied down somewhere that's relatively inaccessible. 
Um, we mentioned vegetable hammocks for vegetables or plastic baskets. Um, you load up day before departure, maybe a day before that, and then on the day of last minute for fresh food. Um, early food should obviously be more accessible um, and make sure that everything's labelled. It's really important to have labelling um, so that people can find things. You can't underestimate or you can't overestimate how tired people will, will can be um, well, on these long distance voyages. Um, and then a couple of words on waste management. Um, what we like to do is have three containers. Um, one is paper and combustibles. That goes overboard. Um, soiled glass, plastic and cans. Um, rinse those in seawater and then stow them uh, to, to, for when you get back. Or, um, and clean glass and plastic cans um, you can just stow. The reason for washing the soiled stuff is it will stink if you don't. Um, the alternative is to double bag it in plastic bags so the smell can't, can't get out. Uh, that's, that's one I've learned the hard way. Um, so that's, that's all I've got to say on waste management. Um, so it takes longer than you think. Um, it's definitely it's a tractable thing, but don't leave it to the last minute. Uh, start early. Um, so thank you very much. Welcome again to our welcome again to our Wednesday yachting luncheon. Today our guests are Tony and Landon of Thirty Knot Gourmet. So, uh, how is it? Can you remember the moment when you first decided let's make a business out of this? So I was I was uh, provisioning for a, for a friend's pack cup that I was planning to go on but didn't make in the end and. Uh, Landon tasted some of the cassoulet that I was provisioning for, for that race, and she said, this is the best cassoulet I've tasted since I was in Paris 10 years ago. And that was the germ of, uh, of, the, uh, of turning it into a business. <laughs> and so uh, let's actually ask a question about that, too. How did you two guys, you're both chemical engineers, PhD, Master of Science, how did you meet? Uh, we, we both work for a biotechnology company in uh, in based in the Bay Area. And so did you, uh, did you uh, create a business plan uh, uh, or did you just say, we're going to start this business? How did you start it? Well, yeah, we've known each other for 20 plus years, working first in biotech together and then our careers went off in different areas. But both of us were entrepreneurial and uh, we reconnected um, in, you know, just in the context of the Bay Area uh, startup scene. Um, and we've both always just loved to cook. And uh, like I said, I think this cassoulet, I had a ratatouille experience where I just went back to <laughs> cassoulet in, in Paris, and that started the business idea. So let's talk about a minimal engagement for a client and a maximal engagement. What would a minimal engagement be? Uh, a minimal engagement would be we would prepare um, a, meal, a meal menu plan and we prepare the the, the, the prepackaged foods, the the boil in the bag, vacuum packed foods, and the the client could pr uh, provision themselves for the rest of the stuff. The the full service version of that is we would create do the do the questionnaires, create the <coughs> meal plan, prep everything, package it, and then help with the stowing at the, the before departure. Uh, now, I'm going to ask questions of you until I see a question in the audience. So if you have a question in the audience, wave your hand over to John uh, Bechtel, who will uh, lead with a question. And, Johnny, you have a question. Do you do calculations according to uh, calories per day? We don't, typically. We've, we've used a, a sort of what would be a standard meal, um, and pe people seem to pretty much self-regulate. Self so it's somewhat subjective? Yes, I'd say so. Let's talk a little bit about pricing. And John, I see a question over here. 
So let's talk a little bit about pricing. Do you price by the day, by the meal, by the crew member? How do you do it? <clears throat> I'll, I'll, okay. we, we typically do it by, by the day, by the meal, so, roughly. So the, the more crew members, um, the more crew that there are on the boat and the longer the race. So in some ways, you can think of it a little bit like you'd pay for, um, f for, for one of these meal delivery plans that are, that are becoming popular now. That's, that's how we do our calculations. So let's say it's a 60-foot um, boat. 50 foot boat in the pack cup it's going to take 11 days 12 days to get there <clears throat> and you're going to have a uh, seven person crew uh, and they're going to have the three meals a day what's it going to cost for the full service ballpark well, you want to <laughs> well I, I think it's a it's a bespoke quote right so it really does depend because i think i think it depends a little bit on on what foods people want, you know, what level of, of extras they want. So it is a little bit bespoke. So give us a range. I know it's a, it's a question as difficult as saying how much for a bottle of wine. I get that. <laughs> and I'm asking the question anyway. So what, would it, what's, what's, what is a typical engagement on a, you know, 11-day race going to cost? Uh, somewhere between four and 8000 Four and 8000 bucks for like a seven-person, 11-day, full-service yep. Great service. Eight, eight would be full service. Four, four would be the, the more minimal service. Do you guys get a bonus when the boat does well? <laughs> That's a very good idea. Good idea. <laughs> so what's the most gratifying customer comment you can get? What do you like to hear? Um, I think there's a couple of them. Oh, there were on the, on the last <clears throat> slide. There were a couple of, uh, couple of tweets there from, from uh, the Pack Cup. But from, from memory, would you like them talking about the flavor, the nutrition, uh, the food, the ease of preparation? What? The food. It's, it's about the food. Does it, it taste good? It's, does it taste good? Like the, 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 my favorite uh, comment from a, from a Twitter feed from one of the Pack Cup <coughs> was, uh, Tony, you are changing the face of, of racing oh. with, for, by food. How much did you pay for that quote? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we paid nothing for that one. <laughs> uh, we've had people say we should have brought a sommelier with us. We've had people, and, but we've also had, you know, people just say it was such a relief to not have to think about food when you're getting ready for such a, a, a big race, right? You've got so many things to keep track of. We've also gotten a lot of positive feedback that it was just such a relief to be able to focus on other things. A question from the audience. Yes, sir. What is the uh, <clears throat> what's the typical lead time for provisioning, and are there minimums and maximum numbers of portions that, or you know, days, people, portion, that sort of thing, that you would provision for? Yeah. What what was the sorry? Can you repeat the first part of that question? How long does it take to provision? Oh, so I I <clears throat> well, and also I'd like to say I tried the Cassiolet and it was great. Thank you very much. Um, it typically, so we, we'd, we'd love to get uh, a couple of months lead time. Um, the shortest we've managed is uh, two and a half weeks, but that was um, challenging. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's really no minimum number of people. The, the, the price doesn't scale with... Uh, with um, with, with crew numbers, if it was a double-handed race, it wouldn't be a, a, a quarter of the price of, a, of an eight-person crew because there's still the time involved, but um, there's no, no real minimum. How do customers, your clients, how do they goof? What do they do wrong when they're out there? What's the most common thing that they don't know and make mistake at when they're prepping food or cooking or whatever? The, the ones that I've heard of the most are... are Forgetting to take things out of the of the freezer in time and then being being delayed is a pretty common, pretty common. Um, and the other is not being able to find things like with the stowage problems. Stowage problems. That's that's pretty <coughs> common as well. We have a question from the back of the room. Eric, great. Yeah, um, I I took notes on the uh, pressure cooker and you mentioned a another device for that was really good for boiling water and I missed what that device was. It's called a press pot, and they're like 20 or 30 bucks on Amazon. And you've probably seen larger versions in offices and things when you press a button and the coffee comes out. Um, so that was, that was the hot water device. And you weren't talking about the jet boil, the thing for boiling water. 
So when you compare the food you'd prep for a race crew versus a cruising crew, um, first of all, is there a weight per crew member that you kind of calculate? If it's a race crew, let's say it's a TP-52 and it's racing across in a trans pack, how much weight per crew are you going to need for that? And they're going to do that in six days or so. So how much weight per crew? For a six-day, call it five-guy crew. That's a good question, and actually we've never been asked that before, so we haven't, we haven't measured the... But you're a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> well, but now you've asked the question. Next time you ask, we'll be able to answer. <laughs> Again, I think our, the, gen, the general uh, philosophy remains the same, but per that particularly with racing, we try to strip out every excess piece of packaging uh, as, uh, to, to really be um, cognizant of the weight limitations for racing, and we can be a little more, um, we, we can do a little bit more in a cruising environment where that might not be quite as important, but we haven't actually got sort of a number of this is you, what you have to hit. Uh, do you like to have one of the members on the crew identified as the cook on a race? Perhaps at least an, either identified as the cook or identified as the provisioner, the person who's going to be the go-to person, <coughs> The person who's going to make sure, help with the stowage, identify where things are going, um, or you know, give you the, the the skinny on what the crew, crew and the skipper really want um, if it hasn't come through in the questionnaire or the face to face. Yes, Lance Berg. So I, I did pack cup this summer, and um, we used many of these techniques, and I have to say they were very very effective. Uh, we you know we pre cooked, we we sealed it, we froze it, we. We didn't use dry ice. We used uh, normal water ice. We found that uh, it was it worked better on a weight and cold uh, cold basis. Uh, and we had an identified cook who refused the title. That was a <clears throat> that was a different issue. I don't think you can help with that. But you might be able to help us with one of our debates, which was when cooking pasta at sea. It's fairly popular to use seawater since it already has the salt in it. And we found this wasn't, um, using 100% salt water was not a good idea. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And if you believe that some salt water is it okay, how much would you allow in the pasta preparation? Good question. That is a great question. <laughs> By recollection, it's about 25% seawater to three quarters fresh water. But you know, you can just you can mix the seawater with the fresh water and just taste it, and when it's about right. But definitely, pure seawater is too salty. Same for boiling lobsters for the for the cruising uh, folk. So, how else have you used your chemical engineering or your scientific background in your in your business? Well, I, I, Tony addressed it a little bit, but but this art of pasteurization um, you know again we came from the biotech side so so that was something we used to do and work on a lot uh, at work was how to make sure the pro the product was completely <coughs> sterile and uh, that's something we have dialed in and we've spent a lot of time dialing that in um, as Tony mentioned if you just boil stuff the texture won't be so great but if you um, sort of break it down and, and are very careful about how you sterilize it as you put the components back together, you can both get the sterility and keep the taste and texture. I think another answer to, to that question is um, we also do pop-up meals now and again. And um, when we were developing, for example, the cassoulet uh, recipe, um, we tried a bunch that were out there and they were awful. Um, and we went back, so we went back to the classics, the Elizabeth, David, and Julia Child, but then the beans aren't quite right. So I'm actually a scientist. Land, Landon's the engineer, so we ended up doing design of experiments and trying different types of beans, different temperatures, different uh, all sorts of, di of differences to hone in on, on as quickly as possible on, a, on an optimal <coughs> recipe, and we've done that several times. So now cassoulets are known for, you know, being cooked over days, weeks. There's even a famous restaurant in San Francisco, Le Central, who would claim their cassoulet has been going for years. Do you guys recommend anything like that on board? Um, if, if somebody else has done it and put it in a bag for you, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to cook day after day after day in the same pot. It's just not hygienic. 
Talk about that. Um, so well, that, uh, that, that um, in the same pot is, is, is not quite accurate. It's a bit of a marketing thing for, for La Centrale. Essentially, what you do is you cook um, the various meats and the beans all separately, and everything gets combined at the end in um, a particular order at a different time in a sort of hour and a half, two hour cooking process. Um, it is very, very time consuming uh, thing to do. Michael Jabbar with a question. Yes, um, have you looked at any other forms of sterilization other than pasteurization like irradiation or UV? So I've looked at those in, in uh, commercial operations where we've had to st sterilize um, test batches, we've used irradiation. It's not, really, it's, it's, it's not really accessible at the scale that we're, we're doing it, it at. I mean, if, 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 if we were provisioning for half the pack cup, it might be worth looking <coughs> into. So what foods um, have the worst freshness component? That is, do you have to eat them quickly? And uh, fresh fish and, and salads go very, very quickly, particularly without refrigeration. And the longest freshness um, onions, cabbage, and bimbo brand bread. <laughs> Give us a dip. What is bimbo bread? So bim We're from San Francisco. We have to ask about the bimbo part. Well, you, can, you, you can get it in San Francisco, especially in, the, um, in, in some of the, the, the more Hispanic stores. It's, a, it's, a Latin America, it's the largest Latin American uh, bakery company. Bakery company, okay. And they add a, uh, an enzyme to their bread which we used to work on that at our <laughs> biotechnology company by coincidence. And it basically stops it going stale. When, when, stop me when this gets boring. When bread goes stale, it crystal, it's, not, it's not drying, it's actually crystallization. And this enzyme snips off the bits that form the crystals. And so eventually, about three weeks in, it doesn't go stale in the traditional sense. It goes sort of a nasty gummy texture. <laughs> so that's... But it's good but it's good till then. It's like it's like sort of a, a variant of Wonder Bread. But Bim, Bimbo brand is the one to look out for. So, um, what about cocktails? Do you give? Uh, <laughs> can you help people with great? It's six o'clock somewhere out there. Pre, pre, if, especially if you've got ice, prepackaged cocktails are, are great. Or if if you've got time, make make them fresh. We used to when we were cruising because we we uh, we didn't have ice a lot of the time. We would make a uh, rum punch, which is just rum with a squeeze of lime, and uh, a few of those they're, they're quite strong. Do you endorse the British Navy um, rule that uh, the only real grounds for mutiny is withholding the rum from crew? <laughs> I, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Landon, you have a question. Um, no, again, I was just going to say I, I, I highly endorse the two-stroke blender. If you're, if you're into, into cocktails, you can get it online as well. Um, so tell us, is it really true? Do powerboat people eat better than sailboat people? So we, ha I ha we haven't provisioned for powerboat people, but when I was cruising, I saw a lot of powerboat people people out there, and I think the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Missed it again. Darn it. But, but with our help, you guys can, uh, you guys can get ahead. <laughs> we can elevate our gourmet right. experience. Exactly. <clears throat> um, yes, Julia, from the web, we have some comments. <laughs> Actually, this is from me. Julia. Practically from the web. Because I'm, I'm sitting here being jealous because in the days that I provisioned and cooked, we had no refrigeration. We have... You know, not, n our our eggs were in the bilge, and they kept uh, nice and cool. And on a three or four week uh, coastal <coughs> cruise, you have opportunities to stop f to shop. And and I'm I have some wonderful market stories, but you must too. too uh, if you're identifying places where you can shop along the way, where do you particularly look for? And uh, do you have any suggestions? When we were cruising, the, we really liked going to the wholesale markets. Um, the wholesale vegetable market was, was really popular and the wholesale fish market in the places that had them. And there's a sort of counterculture of cruisers out there. And as soon as you arrive in an anchorage, there's a radio net and somebody will tell you, 
taxi's been organised for such and such to go, go to the market. So we do it. We do a lot of that. And then some of the more obscure things, like the, the land crab we saw in the local markets. And then, then we had to get detailed instructions from, from uh, actually a very, very stoned vendor that told us how to get those. <laughs> <laughs> So, have you had requests for um, marijuana-infused food? Not yet. <laughs> new, another new market opportunity for us. Is anyone going to be cruising to Colorado? <laughs> yes, John. Your experience now, is there a racing kitchen that would be yet to, de uh, to be developed that would be more suitable for those conditions over the average kitchen and utensils that we have? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think the, the, the things we describe with the pressure cooker and, and so on, I think it's also important to have, you know, stuff that you can pretty much eat on the rail, so bowls, wide cups. Um, uh, one boat we, were, we, we provisioned for used paper plates because they could go over the side. Um, but mostly it's just wide, w big wide bowls were the, were the main thing. Modifications in cockpit design or things of that sort or, or uh, utensil features, uh, things on the rail that hold your, your, your wine glass? <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the only modifications were really around stowage. So, um, you know, making sure that you've got the hooks and things for putting in the, um, the, the, the hammock for, for vegetables or if you really want to go the whole hog and put in the rails to put on those plastic... Um, plastic baskets. That was mainly around stowage where, where people made modifications. What did you mean when you said pop-up, um, you said a pop-up meal? What's that mean for us? So um, there's, a, there's a movement in San Francisco and some other cities where there's a, a, um, a company kind of called it, it's called Feastly, so I'll give a shout out, a shout out for Feastly. It's like Airbnb but for, for meals. Most of the people on it are professional chefs, although um, we, we started, we, we weren't. Um, you put your meal up there, there's a menu, the company provides restaurant space that we can lease, and then we have one, in, one, one next Friday, we've got a beef bourguignon meal, and then um, on December 1st, we've got a, a wine taster's dinner with a, with a local boutique winery. So it's a, it's a pop-up because it only happens once. Are there ways that you uh, distribute the work between the two of you? Are there things that you tend to do in the business and things that Landon tends to do in the business? Uh, Landon, Landon definitely does more baking and desserts. Yeah, exactly. Tony's, I, I, again, it's just both of where we prefer to cook, and Tony's, Tony's a real meat guy, and I'm more of a vegetable, and I'm more of a um, dessert person. Mm -hmm. so, so give me a day in the life, uh, a day in the professional life. Uh, Tony, what's a day in the professional life for you? What's, what do you do in the morning or the things you do in the morning? So it, it'll start off, so when we're, 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 we're on full swing, it'll start off with um, shopping. So we'll be, we'll be farmer's market. We'll be looking for stuff, and then it'll be various Costco runs or, or wherever. Um, and then it'll just be hard at it in the kitchen, prepping stuff in, in large batches, as, you know, as large as we can make. Um, mm -hmm. Probably from morning till till pretty late at night. When we get further in, we're 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 packaging is takes up a, a lot of time, checking off. Land Landon's also the queen of the spreadsheets, so she's the she's the one she's the organised one out of the two of us. Talk to me about a spreadsheet, Landon. What are we what are we keeping track of here? Food per day menu. Uh, these are days. Vertical columns are days. Rows are. Meals, yeah. what's what? You name it, we're we're keeping track of it, and again, both for for the to help this uh, to help the crew ultimately, uh, but to help ourselves and to to make sure it's just it's lists and lists and lists, right? And and so you have to shop for certain ingredients to make certain um, certain dishes. We're tracking the costs. We're you know tracking the business uh, the business model. Um, so yeah, we've we've got we've. There's a lot of, there's surprising, it's, it's good to be a scientist in this, uh, in this industry. I think another, th another thing is that a lot of, if, if, you're, if you didn't grow up as a professional cook, a lot of your instincts in the kitchen desert you at about eight portions. And so being able to scale things on a spreadsheet, treat it like a, a, a chemistry experiment or an engineering experiment, saves you a lot of heartache. 
So when I buy something in the, in the store now, they give me a label. If I buy like some salmon or something, they put a label on it and it tells me exactly what's in there. And it's pretty amazing, you know. Uh, are you guys, how are you labeling food to go off on trips? So at the moment, we're just labeling it with beef borging on... Felt or, markers? Uh, no, we're using a, 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 a mark, printed, printed labels, but we're not putting nutrition information on them uh -huh. but just because nobody's asked. It's actually... Um, reasonably easy to do. You can type the ingredients as websites and So you're imagining out. that you could do that in the future. We, but right now you're using you're using printed labels that you stick on packages. Exactly. Yeah. We I love that when we were on a trip we love the better labeling and we know what's going on and the people who manage food say, okay, this is the Thursday food, uh, day three food and so on. Uh, what about dry ice? Um I I mean I think it's great for storage in, in a cold uh, in a cold box or if, if you're not running your refrigerator, you want to keep it cold. Um, as I say, in our experience, it lasts for about five or six days in a sealed container. Um, I imagine if you could get wet ice that cold, um, it, would be, it would be better for, due to the physics of ice versus dry ice. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, with dry ice is great. You mentioned paper plates. Talk about paper versus dish glass. What kind of what kind of uh, flatware, and then also what kind of silverware? Um, so paper, paper plates. Some we've had one boat that really liked paper plates because they could throw them overboard. Um, you do generate. It's, it's um, some people don't like to throw paper overboard. It's kind of messy. They 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 you know they the. They're, they're floppy, so you end up spilling stuff. I prefer to just have use a bowl for, for pretty much everything. You can just wipe it out with a paper towel. If you're worried about if 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 you don't want to wash it properly, you can just use a sterile wipe. And then for for um, you can just use a, a, a we just use regular um, forks mainly. We try and make everything bite sized, so you don't need to cut things up. Do you come on board as cooks? Occasionally, if somebody wanted you to come and be a cook, would you do that? Uh, we haven't done it, but we'd certainly consider doing it, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you had your choice of what kind of boat you'd go on yourself, not as the cook's <laughs> provisioning for someone else, but give us your choice. If you're going to go to Hawaii, what would you go over on, Tony? I, I would probably go on a 50-foot catamaran. Um, okay, 50 foot. <laughs> yeah, I can drive it. Well, if, it, if, it's a, if it's 50 foot, then I can, I can crew myself. If it's 100 foot, then I'll just sit back and, and enjoy, the, enjoy the ride. So you like a 50 foot catamaran. Landon, yeah. what's your ride of choice here to Hawaii? I, I, I'm with Tony. I think a, uh, one that's small enough that we could participate, not just, uh, not just be in the lap of luxury. And you like the cats because they're a more stable platform? Is that what you like about them? Uh, yeah, that's why I like the the cats because they're a more stable platform and they've got more room in, in them. I mean, the downside is they don't point as well. But so steak, you didn't mention steak. Is it not a good thing for out there? Is it bad for the, uh, let's say, the digestive tract? I think if, it, if you've got a way of of, uh, of cooking steak, it's great. But I don't think steak's that great unless it's got that nice char on it. And unless you can be cooking on a barbecue, it's not so good. So I've got a great steak cooking story. Uh, we're on the Transpac. We're about five days out. The uh, owner, Cy Kleinman, we're doing a watch change. And he's uh, at the nav station. And he takes his knife and fork. And everybody knows he was literally the greatest owner ever in yachting. And he's, uh, everybody's being served their steak. And pretty soon he says, where is my steak? Where is my steak? We all kind of chuckle because he's this wonderful, gracious skipper. And uh, I'm about to go up as uh, the watch captain on board. And just as we're about, I start to go up the companionway, the boat broaches to port. The boom flies up in the air. Here, mayhem up, up on deck. And the steak flies across the cabin, hits Sai in the face, and drops in his plate. <laughs> and everybody all around just stops. And Sai smooth as ever says it's about time <laughs> <laughs> so he got his steak perfectly prepared and delivered <laughs> Landon and Tony it's been so great speaking with you guys you bring such such fun joy and uh, good health to our sport uh, this has been the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from the St. Francis Yacht Club and with that the luncheon is adjourned Fun, how fun.